Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. There we go. Good to see you guys. Um, so grateful you all uh, made the trek out tonight. Want to say hello to everybody that is tuning online. Glad you are all with us for our Wednesday Night Live. The whole idea of this Wednesday Night Live with our watch is we are getting real data from real people and putting it into your hands, into your living rooms, and trying to make sure that if you are a person that has a Judeo-Christian value mindset, if you've got a biblical world view, then you're going to get the, the information that you need so that way you can make good decisions for your children, for your grandchildren, for your community. And uh, it's time that the church wakes up, that we take back the public square. And that is the whole idea of what we're doing on Wednesday nights. So we've had some incredible uh, guests out, and tonight will be no exception. I'm going to introduce her in just a minute. She doesn't really need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, but I just want to remind you, if you're here tonight and you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube and you haven't uh, followed us on Instagram or liked us on Facebook, or if you're not following me on Twitter, uh, I'd love to have you do that. My Twitter handle is at RealPastorTim. So I'd love to have you follow us because we're putting a lot of information out there, and I think it's good for us to have information. Uh, it's hard to make decisions for our families when we don't have good information, and so we want to be a good source for you guys. We are going to uh, open up this as we open up uh, the time tonight. This is the Word of God, and we, we know that, that this is what should guide our worldview. And before, before we do that, I will introduce our speaker. I, I it was funny, as I was doing the video to invite people out for tonight and invite people to tune in online. I had to redo it three times because I'm so used to saying Assemblywoman Melissa <laughs> Melendez. Um, but I think it's really cool that for this is my first time to be able to introduce to you guys Senator Melissa Melendez. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's just incredible. I, I was really excited to have you out tonight and, and everybody is tuning in online is is going to be in for a treat because it was cool last week we had chad bianco on mm -hmm. sheriff chad bianco and he was talking about how he just had the privilege of swearing you in yep. and yeah. um and, and he was so well received here with our our live audience and everybody that was tuned in online just loved hearing from him and he was so proud to be able to do that for you <laughs> and so i thought that was cool um but you've got a lot going on, and we've got a lot going on in our state. We've got a lot going on in our nation right now, and we want to get through as much of this as we can tonight. And I just want to open up with the Word of God, Mark chapter 3, because there's, a, there's just so much right now, and there's so much division, and we know that this is the oldest trick in the book. Satan wants to divide and conquer. It's all the way back to the Garden of Eden. But Mark chapter 3 in verses 24 and 25, it says, A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Mm -hmm. And hopefully by the end of the night, as we put some information in your hands and you're able to take that back home, hopefully you'll see that there is a spiritual battle that's being fought right now. There is a battle for the soul of America. And I, I really want to be able to leave an inheritance for my children's children. And that means far more than money. It means I want to leave an America that I grew up in. I want that America for my children. I want an America where people can walk out in their streets and not be worried that there's going to be riots or looting or anything like that. I want a, an America where kids aren't afraid of the cops. In fact, they have a tremendous amount of respect for the cops. And um, that's not going to happen by us being divided. And so you can see that our enemy, the devil, is hard at work right now mm -hmm. trying to divide us. And um, not only us as a kingdom, uh, you know, the, the idea that a kingdom divided by civil war will collapse, but also family splintered by feuding. And how many uh, of you have found yourself in discussions about the current state of things with your family members and found yourself feuding? <laughs> okay, most all of you. And I'm sure everybody watching online, you're sitting there going, uh-huh, that's been all of our conversations lately. And uh, that, that's very difficult. So let me just give you an opportunity as we con continue in on this interview, if you feel comfortable, just share people your, your faith and where you're coming from as our senator. Sure, and thank you for having me mm -hmm. tonight, and it's nice to see everyone. I haven't been in a big crowd with, without people having a mask on in a while, so, gosh. 
It's nice to see your act, your whole face, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> um, when we are in the Capitol, we are required to wear masks, and it's, you know, you can't breathe, you can't hear people, so this is nice. Um, so I am Catholic. Um, we, my husband and I have five children, so we are a family of faith. Um, we, you know, we eat dinner together, we pray together. That's how we start our meals, because I think that's important. Um, we all have gone through you know, tough times in our lives at one point or another. When my husband was deployed to Afghanistan, um, and our kids were very little, you know, I think our youngest was three, um, it became very real to me that sometimes, God forbid anything you know, would have happened to him when he deployed, that there's no human being that you can lean on to console you in a, in a time of, of grief. You know, you have to, you've got to fall back on God. You just have to. There's no one else. And so we always made sure that um, even though the kids were young and maybe, you know, at three years old, it's hard for them to sit still, let alone, you know, sit down and concentrate and pray. But we did that anyway. And now it's, it's normal to them. It's just, you know, it's just part of their lifestyle. And I hope they continue that into their adult lives. We all change, you know, as we age and we go through different periods of rebellion, I guess, knock on wood, that hasn't happened in my house yet. I'm sure as I say that, something's going to happen when I get home tonight. But I have four boys, so it's to be expected. Um, but it's, when I'm watching what's going on in this country and in this state, it's, you know, for lack of a better word, it makes me sad. Mm -hmm. It really makes me sad because we all have differences, um, but I don't understand why we can't talk about those differences without violence. And, and I think there's some legitimate concerns out there. But again, we don't solve anything if we're yelling at each other, if we're destroying property and, and things like Nothing gets done that way. It's just, you know, the winner is going to be the one with the most force. And I don't think that's the best way to live. So we're working through this, you know, as you can imagine from a state legislator perspective, there's one way I have to look at it. And then as a mom and as a wife and as a Californian, there's another way that I look at it. And those two, you know, have to meet in some fashion. So I am interested in hearing how everybody here feels about it. And I know there's varying degrees of, of stress about it, and I know there's different opinions about it, but we don't get to the heart of it if we don't just sit and talk about it. Right. Um, it's cool because we've, we've talked a lot. Uh, obviously, in the, in the past, because we're in a weird time right now, but in the past, one of the, the doors God opened up for me to, to try to be the salt and the light in the community, it was in the public school system. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the sex ed curriculum that, that's being propagated all over the state of California is just repulsive. And um, they've taken it outside the context of, of sex ed and pushed it in all the other areas of school. I mean, they're indoctrinating our children into weird forms of sexuality that are contrary to what the Bible teaches us, contrary to my faith as an evangelical, your faith as a Catholic, and we've had many discussions on that, and I was really pleased to see that we were like-minded and that uh, you were really looking out for what, quite frankly, is the majority of your constituents' feelings. Well, and my position has always been when it comes to sex education in school is that the school has no business teaching my kids about sex. That's my job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think most parents feel that way. I most mean, that's, do. that's a delicate topic, that's a sensitive topic, and it's one that they should be having with people they trust and love and are part of their family, not you know, whatever teacher happens to show up that day. Right. No, 100% agreed. That's why when, when we heard that Jeff Stone's seat was open and somebody we knew trust and trusted was running for that seat, um, we were happy to, to get behind you and happy to know that you were running. So um, talk about your, how your campaign went because um, it's, it's funny. You go from a campaign... And if you've ever been involved in a campaign, one thing you know is it is just a tremendous amount of stress on the person running and their entire family and all their friends. And um, so you go from the campaign to what we're in right now, which is just really uh, probably a hard time for you. But how did the campaign go? I want to know, how, like your constituents, how did they rise to the occasion? I mean, how, how did that go for you? Obviously, you won by a great margin, so that's good. Um, yeah, yeah. But... How was it? How did that it, roll out for you? It was, um, 
unorthodox. <laughs> you know, we, so I think it was March 17th when we were all sent home from Sacramento, um, which is, you know, in the middle of our campaign. It was a quick campaign because Senator Stone resigned and, you know, then they had to call a special election. It was, okay, get moving. So normally, if you're going to run for office, you have some time to plan. Um, this, not so much. Um, so we were okay during the primary, up in, you know, prior to the March 3rd election, but then things kind of came to a grinding halt. So when, you, when you're asking for someone's vote, I think you should go ask them for your vote. They should meet you. I mean, you can't, remember, the Senate district is a, nearly a million people, so obviously I can't meet everyone, but you try to meet as many as you can, and I think it's appropriate that I go and I ask someone, Here, I'm Melissa Melendez, here's what I stand for, may I please have your vote, I want to represent you. I think that's how it should be done. Well, <laughs> you couldn't do that. You couldn't go door to door. You couldn't, um, you couldn't do any of that. So we had to resort to some different tactics, a lot of social media, which is not my favorite way to campaign, but you do what you have to do. Um, we did some telephone town halls. I got on Facebook. I do a lot of Facebook Live videos, and I have been doing that, so that was helpful to me because I already had a number of followers who would get on there to hear what I had to say and, and update them, so that, that was helpful to me. Um, but it was, you know, it was a little sad to not be able to go meet new people, but turns out, you know, it was okay because I won by almost 11%, so yay me. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say going through that? I mean, was there an element of the campaign that was really difficult? Like, mm. what, what made it the hardest for you? Definitely not being able to go talk to people. You know, normally I would be holding town halls. We would be having debates, forums, things like that. We got to do none of that. A little bit prior to the March 3rd election, we did have... Um, a, not a debate, more like a forum, I guess you could say, um, in the desert area, and then nothing after that. So that, to me, was disappointing um, that you, you know, that you couldn't do a normal campaign because that's what motivates people. And you know, we had so many people who wanted to help. They wanted to go knocking on doors. They wanted to do all those things, and they couldn't. And so they were all in their house going, "What do we do?" And I'm saying, "I don't know." <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that's difficult. Um, you know, for for those of you who have not reached out to Senator Melendez, um, one of the things you'll know about her, and and you can trust us about her, is she will respond. In fact. It was you that told me today, right? Yeah, that, hey, I love that about her. I reached out and she actually responded. And um, that, that doesn't, all, yeah, a whole letter. You know, it's, it's sloppy it's, handwriting, but it's hand, mine. Handwritten letter, you know, <laughs> it, that's, that's rare to, to get a handwritten, that's almost like a lost art form, yeah. you know. Um, so I, I think it's a cool thing and you can trust that about her. So um, that that's, had to make it hard because that's your personality. Yeah. That's, that's kind of how you do things. Yeah, but it is. what that's... was the most enjoyable part then? What did <sighs> The enjo most enjoy. Oh boy, I don't. Mm. Can I get back to you on that? Because sure. <laughs> All right. We're I mean, I I just <laughs> it was a it was a tough way to campaign. So I think um, probably the response via social media, um, the comments people would post, and and I could answer their questions, especially for those who didn't know anything about me. I mean, everybody, you know, they not everybody, a lot of people know me in southwest Riverside County, but they didn't know me in the desert cities. And so it was an opportunity for me to say who I was and what I stood for, and they got their questions answered. So that was nice. But I don't know that there was one thing that was necessarily um, enjoyable. I think um, every campaign is kind of nerve-wracking, yeah. you know, and you just do your best. And the, and the only thing you can do is, you know, as my father-in-law used to say, give it up to God. <laughs> you know, yeah. what's, what's meant to be is going to be. You do your best, and if you're supposed to be there, then you'll be there. See, if I was in your shoes and I was going through that campaign, somebody said, what was your favorite part about the campaign? I would Other have than said, winning? Winning. <laughs> right. Yeah. You said campaigning, Win yes. though. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that had to be great news, especially, like I said, by, by such a great margin. But um, I, I'm just grateful that you're there. I, I'm grateful that you respond when we have questions. Um, I'm grateful that, that you value the church being able to be open. And that, that's huge. Um, you know, when, when we were going through Easter time, yeah. not, not everybody knows this. I did put it out publicly, but not everybody knows this. But, you know, we were having trouble opening up for our drive-in style church service. And um, God used 
Senator Melendez to ensure that we were able to do that because she reached out and she pulled some strings and, <laughs> yeah. and uh, we, had, we had the most successful drive-in Easter service in Southern California. You know, and so that, and that happened because you value the church, being able to be the church, being able to, to have an effect on the community. And, there and that's was cool. a lot of um, sadness amongst people who realized they couldn't go to church on Easter mm -hmm. Sunday. I mean, yeah. that's our most important holiday, really, other right. than Christmas, right? Right. Well, it's, depending it's, on it's, how it's you look at it, it's the most it's holy the most, day of, you know, of the year for Christians. And, and it, you know, we just all were thinking, how is it possible that we can't go to church? I mean, <laughs> like, this is craziness, you know? And when we're looking at what's going on today, <laughs> you know, this is fascinating to me that our state says, you're all going to die if you go to the grocery store or you go to the gym or you go congregate somewhere. And then we have people rioting and looting in the streets and suddenly everybody's for the First Amendment. And, <laughs> you know, I'm going, well, wait a minute. I, when did we cut out parts of the Constitution that we had the right to exercise? You know, so... It's, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, it seems very targeted against the religious communities that they're not allowing churches to serve their congregants. Um, I firmly believe that. Because, you know, remember, we have a lot of people, not everybody in Sacramento, but there are too many people who think that we're the crazy ones. They think because, you know, we cling to our Bibles that there's something wrong with us, that because we have faith in the unseen, that there's something wrong with us mentally. They don't get it, right. you know? And, and I, to that I say, it's okay that you don't get that, but don't get in my way of me and God. Just don't get in my way, right. that's all. Right, yeah. Um, it, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. There's definitely a targeted attack right now on, on the church and the First Amendment. Um, we're watching it before our very eyes. And it's funny to me because we see the highlights right now of Gavin Newsom out cleaning off the, the law enforcement memorial Graffiti. there. Um, and I would just beg the question, we had 15, roughly 15,000 people there on Memorial Weekend doing a very peaceful protest. And Gavin Newsom didn't have to go clean up that memorial after us. Right, yep. Because we left it clean, yep. you know. We were there peacefully and yet we had hundreds of law enforcement officers there with a very intimidating, and you guys know I love law enforcement, but they had hundreds of them there with a very intimidating approach to us who were there peaceably assembled, mm -hmm. exercising our constitutional rights and well, making sure we, trying to ensure we weren't able to do that. Now, you saw what happened, you know, what's happening over the last several yeah. days there, and I didn't see that type of force there mm -hmm. for, well, for this. The problem is you have people who want to peaceably protest or, you know, congregate for, for their cause, and then you have the people who come in who want to cause trouble. They're, they're the problem. So oftentimes when you see law enforcement in full force like that, it's to protect you. Right. Because... We don't know when they're going to come in and start causing trouble. And the last thing we want is to see anybody get hurt. So I know sometimes it feels like they're trying to keep us from doing what we want to do. But most times it's because they're worried about who's going to come in and do the sorts of things that we've all seen, you know, on the news. I mean, we had a peaceful protest today in Lake Elsinore. And, you know, I was concerned because you don't know. You who's don't know. I mean, you see the social media posts come out and wear your mask and bring this and that. And you go, okay. What's going to happen here? And it was fine. There was no violence. There was, of course, you know, all of Main Street was boarded up with plywood just, <laughs> just in case because they learned. And the same thing in the desert cities. Tuesday, or, yeah, Tuesday night, um, they were planning a protest there, and, you know, they boarded up all the windows because we saw what happened in New York and in Colorado and Philadelphia and, and everywhere else. And we shouldn't have to do that. This is America, not Nicaragua. Right. I mean, my goodness, it's just... I feel bad, you know, for the business owners who've lost everything. And but you got to remember that that, that other side, they're they're feeling the people who are causing the trouble. When I say the other side, their their feeling is that well, you have insurance; it'll pay for it. I mean, really, they. I mean, these are things that they say: insurance will pay for it. Well, no, insurance doesn't always pay for it, and you you can't get that back, especially 
the smaller businesses. I'm not talking about the big, you know, corporate stores. I'm talking about the mom and pop places who have built this business over years and it's been in their families. And you know how much those window panes are? Just the glass that they, it's like $1,500 to replace that. Insurance doesn't cover all of that. So it's just a difference in, I think, what we want this country and this state to look like. There's a big difference. And you right. know that. I mean, you've been following this and we've had plenty of conversations about the politics in this state and how our views really aren't matched up. And, and it's our job to, um, no, no, matter, no matter your political party, I don't, I don't care what your political affiliation is, but if you believe in the basic tenets of society that you should be able to practice your religion, you should be able to do so without interference from the government. You should be able to run your business without interference from the government. You know, you pay the taxes that you owe and you don't have the government come take more and more and more just because you have it and they have things that they want to buy. Just the basic rules of society I think are askew in this state, and it's our job to to bring that back, and we have to do that at the voting booth. You know, we just, we have to. We don't have any other, there's no other way for us to do it. Right. So with that in mind, let me ask you this. So does the state, or, and I put at least the conservative senators and assembly members. <laughs> all three of us, uh, no, All three of you in the Senate. <laughs> um, do you see these these riots and and, the, the non-peaceful protests, I mean, you talk about a peaceful protest today, I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. um, but do you see the, the non-peaceful protests, the riots, the looting, do you see this as a coordinated attack on our nation, on our state? Yes. Um, especially, so yes, yes uh, but I especially do. as we see elections <laughs> coming up. So, mm. so maybe two parts there. So you do see it, maybe explain how you see it that mm -hmm. way and then maybe tag on the, yeah. the elections I coming up. I, I think it is a coordinated attack. I think anybody who's looking at this objectively could see that as well. Um, you know, you have people who are who are being funded to purchase, you know, whatever equipment it is that they, I mean, I saw people out there wearing gas masks. Does anybody else here have a gas mask laying around at home? Because I don't, and I was in the military. You do, okay, of course you do. <laughs> Other than the pastor. <laughs> I mean, it's very bizarre to me to see the number of things going on, and it is a coordinated attack. Anyone who thinks otherwise is just not looking at this with their eyes open. And it's, I, I mean, we've had the people come up to Sacramento and testify in hearings telling us they want to abolish ICE. They want to abolish police as a whole. Right. They don't think it should exist. And you just go, I mean, there, so you want no law and order whatsoever. So when someone comes and harms you, who exactly are you going to call? Don't call me because I'm not going to come help you. I mean, this is the kind of craziness that's infiltrating the state. And I don't know when it started. You know, my, my kids and I, we were talking about this. Um, I just wonder, when did this happen? When did, I mean, it might start with education, might start with their schools, I don't know, where we're teaching kids that you should always feel like you're the victim. Well, this country was came into existence because we're fighters, right? And we let everybody fight alongside of us, no matter what your color is or your religion. That's why people came here. Right. So I don't know why we are teaching kids these days that they are victims, because they grow up thinking they're victims, and then suddenly you know, you're wrong because you're different than they are, and you must be the one trying to take something away from them or keep them from achieving their, their goals. And that's not the way this country is. It's just not. So um, the coordinator attacks are real, and I know the media doesn't want you to think that, but I'm sorry, that's just, that's not looking at it for what it is. And right. <laughs> it's our job to, to stop it. What was the second part of the question? Yeah, <laughs> I so it's a <laughs> I, Yeah, I, I like what you said. I mean, anybody looking at this objectively can see it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely coordinated. Do you feel that, that part of the intention is to mess with our upcoming mm -hmm. elections? Well, the governor um, wants the November election to be an all mail-in ballot, so yeah. So he made some changes today. I was rolling through the news before I came in to see that, um, let's see, there will be a polling place for every, I think it's 10,000 voters. I believe it's 10,000, it might be 100,000, it might be losing a zero there, but it's more than, it's more generous than what he originally proposed. Um, but I like to go to the polls to vote. That's just what I like to get my sticker. I like to go in, you know, market. That's my thing. I like that. 
Um, this last election, everything was by mail, which is fine, but you know how many people I had reach to me and say, I didn't get a ballot, um, or I got two ballots, or my mother, who passed away two years ago, got a ballot. What do I do with it? You know, so that election Give it to me, integrity. I'll fill it out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Election integrity is a problem in this state, and um, particularly in Riverside County, I will tell you that. You know, we had to go back and forth with the registrar's office because they have ballot drop-off boxes right outside the registrar's office. It's like a big mailbox out there. Well, remember that since the state passed the law that says you can do ballot harvesting, which means everybody in here, you can collect as many ballots as you can. It could be 100,000 ballots. It could be 200,000 ballots. It doesn't matter. You can collect them all and then turn them in. We as a church are going to be doing that. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there are other people, I and mean, we've been asking the churches, that's one way I think that we can kind of beat them at their own game, is right. to do our own ballot harvesting. Right. Um, if someone came to my door and asked for my ballot, I wouldn't give it to them. I would say, get out of my porch, you know. But um, we have issues with people being able to collect all those ballots and then go to the registrar's office and just dump them all in there. Now, you know, on the envelope... You are supposed to sign. If, you are, if someone else is turning in your ballot, that person has to sign their name. That's the law. Well, they're not doing that when they're dumping all those ballots in that box in front of the registrar's office. And when we asked, well, um, you know, what do you do in that situation if someone comes up and just puts a box full of ballots at your front door? And her response was, well, we have to accept them and count them. Okay, well, do you go after the person who just broke the law by dropping all these ballots off and... Eh, you know, so we have a ballot integrity problem in California. The only way we're going to combat that is to do our own ballot harvesting in churches, you know, in places of worship, places where people trust that their ballot is going to be secure and it is going to be turned in. So, yeah. yes, I do think there is an effort to interfere with elections. I think their thinking is that... Um, if everybody's mailed a ballot, it's easier to ballot harvest. It's easier to, you know, when you go to work for your boss to say, hey, everybody bring in your ballots tomorrow. And if you do, everybody gets a, you know, $25 Starbucks gift card, right? There's sort of that inherent, um, you know what I'm saying. So, or there's no reward. There's just you better bring in your ballot tomorrow. So that is concerning. I will tell you, though, that um, this election of mine, which was a special election, and everybody was home, right? Nobody could work. So I wasn't sure what was going to happen, because you figure everybody's home. And so, you know, they're looking at that ballot. If they were working, they might forget about it. But now they're saying, well, you know, I'm tired of watching the news. I'll fill out that ballot. So we were concerned, because my Senate district is a split district. It is, as far as registration goes, it's about half Republican, half Democrat. Um, not like my assembly district, which was, you know, overwhelmingly Republican. So I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But it turns out that even though the, ter the voter turnout was very high for a special election, because special elections typically don't get a high turnout, um, it was higher than normal. But we didn't see, um, it didn't come to fruition, the fears that people had that, you know, the ballot box would be stuffed and people would be ballot harvesting. But remember... They couldn't go door to door collecting ballots. So November, that may change. So I would just say we need to be vigilant because they are definitely trying to rig the system. Yeah. And, and, but what they say it is, don't you want every ballot to be counted? Don't you want to make it easier for people to vote? They say, well, of course I want to make it easier for people to vote. I just don't want them voting twice or three times. Or, you know, and I want right. people who are legally allowed to vote to vote, not everybody who gets a ballot in their right. hand. Right. Um, so with, with this concerted effort to, to attack our elections, I mean, we can see, I, you know, I don't know where all of you are at with the whole COVID thing, but I see that as a whole part of this attack, personally. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that it is everything they said it is, mm -hmm. um, and numbers are proving that. So I, I believe that's a part of it. Of course, the riots right now that are, are going on, um, do you think that there may be another level to this that we haven't seen yet? Um, that, I that wasn't on my list of questions yeah. I told you about, but I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> Snuck it in there. Yeah. Um, another level meaning... Like anything else that may come our way that, that blindsides us that... 
Well, I mean, I mean this certainly did blindside everyone. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, when you look at the number of deaths in this country, the majority of them were in New York. And they are a flat out hot mess in New York. I mean, the number of people who died in nursing homes there. And you know, in California, they did the same thing where in New York, their governor was forcing the nursing homes to take in COVID positive patients. We did the same thing in California. Um, so, you know, it's, you sit back and you look at the number of deaths, which of course, if it's your loved one who died, I mean, you're devastated. So I'm not taking away from the fact that it is absolutely awful when someone dies from something they could have maybe prevented them from getting. But the way they did this by literally shutting down the entire state, just, I mean, is it not a threat anymore? Because I was told it was, and I have to wear a mask, and they sent us all home, and we can't have normal session in, in Sacramento and do the people's work, but there are people out there rioting and looting and marching, and that's okay. So is it a threat or is it not? I think they need to make up their minds. And right. so I question you know, yeah. what's really going right. on. Well, yeah, I, and we need to question everything. Yeah. You know, and if, if we don't, we get what we get. This is where we're at because we haven't questioned everything. Um, I, I think from the pulpits, the pastors need to be sharing these things with their congregations mm -hmm. and um, giving, giving them the information they need. Not only the information they need, but what does this say about it? Because mm -hmm. the Bible has a lot to say about everything that's going on right now. And these things shouldn't catch us by surprise as believers. Um, there's so much that the Bible tells us about things that are going to be coming up, and these are all just the beginning. You know, one of the things the Bible tells us, though, is when you see these things start to happen, and I would tell you they are happening, so uh, we don't have to wait for them to start to happen. They're happening. The Bible says, look up. Your redemption is drawing close, and, and this is just continuing on, continuing on. We need to be awake, looking around, seeing what's going on, and questioning everything. So, do you think that there's an end in sight to the current situation with the riots? I mean, we're, we're watching strong people like Sheriff Chad Bianco take the stances he's taking, and, and I've been feeling pretty safe here in Riverside yeah. County knowing and trusting who's there at the helm. Um, that brings a, a lot of peace and comfort to, to me and my family, not that we don't have our guns locked and loaded, because we do. <laughs> we do, because we're not going to be victimized. Right. Um, but I, I have confidence, you know, that, that we can go about our life and, and know that, that he's got this going well as far as what, as well as well can be. But is there an end to this current thing? I mean, mm -hmm. what's, what's being talked about amongst the senators? The, you mean among you, uh, yeah, I mean, the George Floyd issue or the yes, COVID yes, issue? Yes, the current, okay. the, yeah, okay. I... I the COVID thing to me is it just at this point is just a joke. Yeah. Um, we've moved it, on. I we've guess. moved on, yeah. but I see the current riots and stuff that's going on, and I see the the potential for loss of life and property, and that's concerning. Yeah. Um, but do do you think that this is going to start to well, wane a little bit, or I, I hope or is it so. going to increase? I hope not. Um, so today I was watching the press conference with um, George Floyd's family, and there the family attorney spoke, and his brother spoke. And the attorney kind of laid down the gauntlet. And he said that they expect uh, the other three officers to be charged and arrested prior to Mr. Floyd's funeral, which is tomorrow. So, you know, I'm watching it thinking, well, that's going to be interesting because if they don't arrest those other officers, because the crowd is listening, and though he didn't say these words, I think likely many of them received it as, okay, if they don't arrest these officers, then that's our go sign, right? He didn't say that, and maybe he wasn't thinking that when he said it, maybe, you know, I don't know, but right. I just think that for the people who want to cause trouble, that's exactly what they heard. So um, the funeral is tomorrow. I'm hoping once they lay Mr. Floyd to rest that then we can all kind of start this healing process and start listening to one another again. And I'm hoping that there isn't round two of this violence. I think there's still some out there who just, you know, they're looking to cause violence every chance they get, you know. But if they don't have the mob behind them, then they're kind of blowing in the wind and maybe, maybe they don't go through with it. Um, I hope they got it out of their system because they've made a lot of, um, you know, caused a lot of damage in the process. So we will see, 
like I said, they did arrest the other officers. They are being charged. Um, they changed the charge for the officer who did kill Mr. Floyd. They changed it from murder three to murder two. Um, so, you know, and very likely you, know, you may see these charges change as we go on. There's nothing set in stone that says you can't add on or, or change the charges. Um, so we'll see what happens. But then, of course, you know, we all have to brace ourselves for when this finally does go to trial and the outcome of that trial. And will that be satisfactory to the people who are watching? Right. And that we don't know. So. Right. So we had a, a good old-fashioned prayer meeting here at 4 o'clock. Um, we prayed from 4 to 6, took a little break, and then now we're all here together. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would be, as a pastor, the thing I would tell people first is go to the Lord in prayer. We need to pray, and uh, when we're done praying, we need to pray some more. <laughs> so that, that's important. But as our elected official, what would you say for, for us in this situation, the, the riots, the, all this, this turmoil going on, besides praying, what would you recommend that we do if we want to affect change? Well, you know, there are some very strong opinions about what is taking place, what happened, what didn't happen, what's right, what's wrong. And I will tell you this, from, um, from a mom's perspective, from someone who served a number of years in the military, alongside people of every race, religion, creed, you know, you name it. We, I guess we need to adopt more of a military style of thinking in this because when we, you know, when we were given a mission to complete, you, you could have cared less what color the person was next to you. You just all wanted to do the same thing to get the job done. And none of that other stuff ever, you know, came up in conversation. And everybody came from different backgrounds. And I have had conversations with people I served with um, who were African American who, you know, had some people say some pretty awful things to them and had some very um, negative interactions with law enforcement. And then a lot of them didn't, you know? But I think we cannot dismiss the fact that people are upset about this and that there is, um, there are times when we have folks in law enforcement who, who cross the line, who aren't of the mindset where they should be in a position to exert their authority over the public. We can't, I mean, it, we just can't deny that. We know that exists. That is in our country's history, okay? So I don't think it's right that people say, well, what did he do? And well, what ha well that doesn't matter what he did. It just doesn't matter. I think we have to talk about that maybe not everybody is suited um, for that type of job in law enforcement. And, and law enforcement, believe me, they want to root out the people who don't belong. Just like teachers want to root out the teachers who just aren't doing a good job, and doctors and nurses and everybody. So it is not all of law enforcement that um, is bad. It's just there are times when we have some who are bad. And as a community, listen to people. You know, don't, it's so easy as humans to, you know, go with your instinct, go with your gut. Somebody says something immediately, that offends you, or you disagree, and then off you go. We can't do that anymore, because look what's happening. So people want to be heard, there are legitimate concerns, and we got to talk about it. And then come up with, okay, what's the answer? Because, again, law enforcement wants the tools to do their job properly. They really do. Um, so let's make sure that they have it. But we also have to listen to them because there's nothing worse than, I mean, I'm not a teacher. So why should I tell a teacher exactly how you should run your classroom? I need your input in order to know how to help you do the best job. It's the same thing with law enforcement. And I think there is um, a divide right now, certainly in the legislature. I mean, I, I serve with some legislators who absolutely hate law enforcement. They think everything they do is, is designed to, to harm them. So somehow we got to maybe look past those folks and their attitudes and get the majority of the other people together and say, okay, let's, you know, how do we figure this out? But the way you figure it out isn't by separating ourselves and segregating ourselves and doing damage to innocent people's lives and, and property. Yeah. Um, I like that you say get a, a military mindset. <laughs> Obviously, um, 
you know, in what you're saying, you don't care what color they are next to you when you've got that mission to accomplish. And I think as Christians, understanding that we're in a spiritual battle, we need to take on that military mindset as well. Um, knowing the, the things that God has told us, so we need to stand fast. The Bible says stand fast. How many of you know stand fast is actually a military term? It, that, that is, I mean, God's using military terms for us as believers to stand fast. And that means when you're up against the enemy, you don't back down. As much as they throw at you, as difficult as it may be, as whatever names people are going to call you, and believe me, I've been called them all, um, you, know, you, you know you. You know who you are. You know that you're not a misogynistic, bigoted, xenophobic, homophobic, whatever, you know. Um, they're going to call you these things as you stand for righteousness because you look at what's going on in our state right now, in our nation, and across the world, um, all the things that we find in here are under attack. The fact that God created the heavens and the earth, the fact that he instituted what marriage is supposed to be, what sexuality is supposed to be, what gender is supposed to be, how, what, what happens for um, lazy people. Think about what, what rights people have, what, what we've called rights. I mean, we, we've come to the point in time in our nation where we say that food is a basic right. Food is not a right. Food is a privilege of hard work. Bible says if a man does not eat, I mean, if a man does not work, he shouldn't eat. So everything in here is under attack, and as you stand for these things, they're going to find reason to call you all sorts of names, and that's where the Bible says you need to stand fast. It doesn't matter. In fact, the more they call you these names when you're standing for Jesus, the more they call you these names, the more blessed you will be. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. You are blessed. That so means stand I am fast. the most blessed person in the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, We've kind of talked about the COVID and, and the riots, but you've been busy uh, just in the last few weeks, and uh, I know there's all sorts of weird, weird bills that have been coming out. We don't need to talk about any uh, in particular. I mean, I know uh, some of the ones I've addressed, that one, one of the ones to me is just incredibly insane is, is there's a bill coming out that would say that... Um, it is illegal to have a boys and girls section in the box doors like Walmart. Like, you can't have a boys clothing section and a girl. It yeah. just has to be everything. So that way, you know, kids are just, there's just no gender, which we'll talk about this on another Wednesday night. But <laughs> the whole idea of androgyny, like neither male nor female, the whole idea of androgyny, that is the highest form in the occult. Yes, a lot of pastors won't even talk about the occult anymore because it's, you know, they don't want to talk about that stuff. But it is the highest form of the occult is androgyny. That's why you see the Baphomet. Have you ever seen a Baphomet that thing has like the wings and it's got breasts but it's a got a goat head and all this it's weird i mean this is this is stuff that's being pushed on us as a society a society all around us and now they want to do this in walmart that you right. can't have a boy section and a yeah. girl section i mean come on talk about confusion and god is not the author of confusion so somebody's authoring these bills mm -hmm. and they're weirdos <laughs> this is weird so yeah what that, are you that bill i i remember that bill um <laughs> And I just kind of scratched my head because as a parent, you know, it's like, help me out. Come on. You know, yeah. I don't, they think they're helping you out. Yeah. They, well, <laughs> but they think it's, um, I'm trying to remember how the bill author phrased it, but they just, they don't think that we should be separating boys and girls and that if we do that sort of thing with clothing, then we will, um, I guess, convince them that, you know, that's the, I don't know. I don't understand it. I mean... You oh, know, it's, if it's I, I have a daughter and I have sons and I dress them, you know, according to their gender um, and except when they become teenagers. And then do you ever notice your daughter start to dress like the boys with the jeans? I don't know. My dad used to complain about that. Why don't you ever wear a dress? Because I like jeans, dad. But um, to, to put all, I mean, that's just, I guess that's their way of pushing their agenda, forcing really their agenda, their ideology onto all of society. And they don't have a right to do that. Right. They just, and they certainly don't have a right to tell a business where they can put their merchandise. Right. I mean, you know, get out of here. Just go yeah. do you in the legislature. And, but you, know, you have to remember that um, in, in the assembly, there are 80 assembly members. In the Senate, there are 40 senators. And I remember before I got up to the assembly, I sort of did a little investigating of 
you know, who's who up there and where they come from and what makes them tick. And I could count on two hands the number of people who had been in the private sector, you know, who had even had a business. So when the people making the laws for the entire state don't have a clue about what it's like to run a business or work in that type of environment, you end up with laws like you have to have all the boys and girls closed together. I mean, it's crazy. I'd like to see like the dresser drawers or, you know, at their homes, you know, what does your house look like? I just, right. I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. Um, I mean, I got a son, he you know, served in the Air Force. I'm proud of him. Mm -hmm. If he ever wore a dress, I don't care how old he is, I will kick his butt. <laughs> I mean, I just, it's, it's, it's an odd thing to pick a fight over with the general public, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, our state, we're, $54 billion now budget shortfall. Don't we have better things to worry about, yeah. really? I mean, we've got people's windows getting bashed in in their businesses, but we're gonna talk about where you put the boys and girls clothes. It's just, uh, see this table? I, I bang my head against it every <laughs> single day up there, and then I get back up again, so. <laughs> um, for the last few weeks, being uh, our elected senator, what's, what's this been like for you? What have you mm -hmm. been working through um, Interesting. I, I know it's I know it's busy right now, mm -hmm. especially because things aren't running as normal. Right. So, it's um, what, what do we need to know about things that are going on? Well, so it's good news, bad news. Um, the good news is, you know, we ran out of time because normally in the legislature uh, we go back in January. I don't know if you're familiar with our schedule, but so we start in January, we go through uh, the end of June. The month of July is summer recess, so we're supposed to be back in our districts working. We don't go back and forth to Sacramento month of July. And then we go back up to Sacramento for the month of August, and then we're done for the year. So you're safe for the year. No more laws after that, okay? And then we come back to our districts. Well, this year, we all get sent home March 17th. And so March is typically when budget or committee hearings start for us. So we literally just started hearing bills in committees and then we're all sent home. So now what we're doing is we're having these marathon committee hearings. I had one on um, a Sunday and it started at nine in the morning and went till 6.30 in the evening wow. because you had to hear everything you know, all at once because you didn't have all those here. You know, normally you would have several hearings. So that's a little crazy. Um, the good news also is that a lot of bills have been dropped because we just don't have the time to hear them all in committee. So that's good, right? <laughs> the bad news is probably the worst ones are actually probably getting through committee. So, <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's, we have to pass the budget by June 15th. So I'm on the budget committee and um, we will have budget hearings next week and then that Monday or Friday, Monday, I don't know, whenever the 15th is, we'll have to vote on the budget. And there's a big battle right now because the governor wants one thing for the budget and the Senate and the Assembly want something else. And so now we're locking horns. We'll see what happens. We have to cut and there's no way around it, but they're trying to make as few cuts as possible. And in order to do that, what do you think they're suggesting they do? That's right, taxes. So um, trying to think of what are the taxes they've come up with? Um, there's two of them. I know there's one, there's, a, there's basically a head tax. It's every employer who has 500 or more employees, every employee they'd get assessed a $275 tax on that employee. Hmm. The business would have to pay that. Um, there is, there's a, I don't know, there's a couple more um, that I haven't seen in committee yet, but they are trying to, oh I know, there's one they want to, um, they want to add a tax to uh, vaping devices because well, hold on, hold on, okay, because <laughs> first of all, no matter how much money you give your state government, they are going to find ways to spend it and then some. It's never enough, okay? So they, they had the cigarette tax, right, which was, I think, $2 a pack, and the voters passed that. And that money was supposed to go to Medi-Cal and, and health, okay? That's, by law, that's what it's supposed to do. What do you think they're proposing on doing with some of that money right now? Not spending it on healthcare and not spending it on Medi-Cal. So as sure as I sit before you this evening, I am telling you, if they pass that tax, it is not going to go to what they say it will go to. I guarantee it. So no matter your feeling on tobacco products or vaping or whatever, just know 
they're not going to spend it on what they say there. In fact, we are about to get sued if they go through with this and take that money from Prop 56 that they, the, the tax on, I think it was $2 a pack um, on, on cigarettes, just, I think just cigarettes. Um, if they do that, the state is going to get sued. Just that simple. So then that costs you money too, because it's your money. You know, the state's not the government's money. Um, so taxes certainly are one way they're planning on filling the gap. They're making cuts to a lot of different things. It's just a question of, you know, where are the cuts going to go? They, we say we don't want you making cuts to education. You know, you cut that enough. Um, and we don't want you making cuts to the developmentally disabled. We don't want, want you making cuts to the services that people, you know, that allow their mom and dad to stay in their own home when they're sick and they're older rather than being sent into a nursing home, you know, things like that. The governor has a different idea. So I don't know how this is going to shake out, but it'll be very interesting. So there is a lot going on. Uh, we're running out of time right now. So um, I want to end with two things. First, um, how can all of us be praying for you? Because oh. God tells us to pray for our leaders, the people in, in positions like you're in right now. And um, I, I think people... If they, if they do what God tells them to do, they just pray very generally mm -hmm. because they don't know what your actual specific prayer requests are. Okay. And, um, and for, for, that goes for all of us and everybody that's watching online. When God tells us to pray for those people in leadership, we should know what they need prayer for. Um, how can we fully do what God's called us to do if we actually don't reach out and go, how can I pray for you? So how can we be praying for you? Okay, well, I have a list. So. All right. <laughs> Um, so first of all, first of all, our oldest son is in the Navy. Um, so pray for him. He's fine, but pray for him anyway. Um, I would say I need, you know, I am like you. I have my moments of weakness where I get frustrated, where I get impatient, where I get short tempered, where I get, I'm not um, any of those things. <laughs> you know, where you just sort of, you know, you're like, gosh, I'm at my wit's end. And I, I think praying for me to have the patience that I need to do this job and deal with, you know, the work-life balance, because that's very important. It can't all be work. And the patience to, to not get upset when things don't go my way, but to have the resolve to just, you know, kind of motor through it and do what needs to be done. The patience to, to be able to kind of stick to it so that I can do right by you. Um, to not give up. That's really the types of prayers that I would like to have because it can be very hard to be in that type of environment. It's like guerrilla warfare up there. Um, and I'm tough, but I'm a human being. And, and I can't be tough 100% of the time. Sometimes I falter just like you do. So I would ask, um, that's probably the best uh, prayer that I think you could ask God for for me is to give me strength. Okay. And patience, I'm, a lot of patience. Patience. So I'm going to ask you guys to specifically pray for her. That, so there's, there's patience that normal people can have. Um, I'm going to ask you to pray specifically that she would have supernatural <laughs> patience. Patience is a fruit of God's spirit in your life. Um, and and there's, there's times where I've been patient just because I know I have to be patient. There's other times I've been patient that I know it was God mm -hmm. bringing that out in me because there's no way I would have been patient in that situation. Right. And so I would pray that you guys, I would ask that you guys would pray that, that at the end of days, she would sit there and go, that was God. Mm -hmm. I know that my constituents were praying for me. So pray specifically that, that she would have that supernatural fruit of the spirit type of patience. That being said, though, so I said I had two things to close on. So we, we've got your prayer request. Um, we've talked about a lot of weighty things, and, and I always like to give my guests an opportunity to just leave on a note of, of basically encouragement. Mm. Like, how can you, I mean, this, some of this stuff is discouraging, let's face it. Um, for those of you who believe like me, and you believe we are in the end times and the Lord's returning, for, for us, this is exciting as tough as some of this stuff is. It's still exciting to know the times we're living in. Um, but even as exciting as the times are, these things are frustrating. They're, a lot of them are not good. So, Leave us with some encouragement. Oh, man. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Okay. Um, well, yes, things are very frustrating um, f for a number of reasons. Not, you know, there's probably some frustration in your personal lives, and then there's the frustration of what's going on in this state. But the pastor 
you know, said it well, that God is always there for us, no matter what. I mean, I know that. There's been plenty of times in my life where it felt like there was no one else really who was kind of with me or on my side, but you always know that God is. That faith is so important. Pray for the people that don't have that faith. Yeah. Um, I think that's very powerful in knowing that there are people out there who just have no one to lean on. And I think that's our job as Christians to make sure that they know that strength too and they, and they have that faith. And it's, you know, some people are very resistant to that, but we got to pray for them. For me, that's, you know, I guess if there is any um, hope um, in this realm that we're talking about, it's that, knowing that your prayers might be one person and you may never even know about it, but I believe that, you know, God helps when you ask him to, for people to find their faith. Um, and, I, and I think that's what we're here to do, is to make sure that all people know God in, in their, you know, way. Um, I just, the thought of someone being so alone is terrifying to me. Um, so pray for them. That's, that should give you hope, because every night you get to bed and you think, okay, God, who did you bring into the fold today? That's a good feeling to know that you, at least you had something, some part yeah. in that. Yeah, the, the darker the darkness the brighter the light yeah. in us is. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah. Great it's encouragement. Stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank having you, me. Thank you, Senator Melendez, for coming out tonight. You bet. Wonderful to hear from you. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say thank you, everybody that came out here. Really fun to have you in a room <laughs> full of people with no masks on. Um, if somebody came in with a mask, I don't see anybody with a mask, but if you did, you're welcome in here, too. Um, but I think it's cool. See, like you said, see their smiling faces. Thank you to everybody that tuned in online. We're just so grateful that you're joining us. And, uh, of course, this is available on YouTube so you guys can share it out. So uh, God bless you all. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you.